first 12 verses of chapter 12 last week. We're going to be picking up there today in verses 13 through 17. So we've been studying the Passion Week, or the Holy Week. So such a valuable, I mean all of Scripture is valuable, but just to understand these, understand these events leading up to Jesus' death on the cross and why Jesus was crucified on the cross, what led up to that point. I mean, just such, a, such an important time in Scripture. And so we've studied how this week began. It began with that triumphal entry. Jesus had traveled with the disciples along with everyone else seemingly in Israel to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem. And so they entered town and then Jesus very strategically got on that, that donkey colt and, and paraded through town while people in the crowd yelled, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, right? They, they would quote this Old Testament scripture to identify Jesus and celebrate Jesus as this anticipated Messiah. And then Jesus, the next day of Holy Week, he cleansed the temple, that very iconic moment in which Jesus made a whip of cords and, and, and got the animals out and, and, and got all the money changers out. Anyone who was buying and selling in the courtyard of the temple, he drove them out of the temple courts. And so as a result of those two instances, we talked last week how Jesus had become a marked man. And there was a series of confrontations that begin to, to take place. We studied the first of those confrontations. And there's going to be, uh, there's like six of them. And that's mainly what happens in all of chapter 12. And so as far as what day of the week it is, like what, what day of the week, it, it, it's, uh, some say it's Tuesday at this point. Other scholars say it's Wednesday. It kind of depends on when you see this, these events starting, what day of the week it's starting on or, or, and how they play out. Um, you know, when you ask me, I'll tell you it's for sure either Tuesday or Wednesday. <laughs> That's where, where I'm at. But it, that leads a lot of scholars to refer to this day, though, as question day. It's question day. Have you noticed all the questions so far, right? When they confront Jesus, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do them? They're, they're confronting Jesus with a question. He confronts them back, right? Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And then he teaches a parable, and then he asks him a question about that parable. And today we're going to study another question in which they ask him about paying taxes to Caesar, and he's going to respond with a question. Next week we'll come back and the, the Sadducees corner Jesus and it's the same day and they got a question about the resurrection. And he, has, he responds with a question of his own. And then in the same day the scribes confront him and they got a question regarding the law. And then Jesus starts asking some questions of his own regarding some Old Testament passages of scripture. And so that leads scholars then just to refer to this day, whether it's Tuesday or Wednesday, it's for sure question day because everybody's got questions. And we're taking our time to study these questions for several reasons, right? Some of these questions, they expose the motives behind the different groups that are participating in this Holy Week and encountering and confronting Jesus. It, it teaches us about the different dynamics that are at play there. We also get to study these questions in an effort to understand some of the theological and doctrinal differences that existed in that time and, and where people stood on them. And of course, you and I, we're, we're studying these not only so that we can understand those dynamics in Holy Week better, but so that you and I can be convicted and fine-tune and tweak what we believe. That's why we go into Scripture. We are going into Scripture right now to tweak how we think, to tweak how we believe, to conform to the will of God, and we believe we need this time together to do that. So we're, we're jumping into where Jesus is being confronted about paying taxes to Caesar. Now, to remember the context, this previous confrontation was between Jesus and the, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Those three groups made up the Sanhedrin. That was kind of the ruling council of Israel, the head honchos. That's what started this collision. It was the head honchos confronting Jesus. And then remember, in that interaction, they really couldn't say everything that they wanted to say back to Jesus. Why? Because they feared the people. Jesus was wildly popular. Everyone loved to hear Jesus preach. They were gathering by the thousands wherever Jesus went to listen to him teach. And so they were really careful how they confronted Jesus because they feared the reaction of the people if they came down too hard 
on Jesus. And so they're changing up their strategy today. When the Sanhedrin put their minds together to confront Jesus, it, it didn't go the way they wanted it to. And so they're adjusting to the game as it's playing out here. And, and they decided to take a different tactic today. They're going to send... They're going to send their minions to do their dirty work this time. Uh, and they do this in a very strategic way. And I want you to appreciate it today so that you can understand how calculated they are. They're sending this really strange combination of people. Two groups that normally wouldn't be considered on the same team. They're sending these two groups that are very polarized to confront Jesus on a really hot topic. All right, so that's, that's kind of the strategy, and that's where we're at. So let's just, let's just read verses 13 through 14 here to kind of dip our toe in the water here and see what's going on. Verses 13 starts by saying this, And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they, ca and they came to him, I'm sorry, and they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are... A true, you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? And then they stand back and wait. See what's going to happen, right? This is the trap. Well, again, we're living in a different time and a different culture. We don't really appreciate the polarization that's taking place in this moment. Like we've seen the, the Herodians and the Pharisees before, back in chapter 3 of Mark, we know that Jesus, whenever he healed the man on the Sabbath, the, hand, the man, man with the withered hand, it was the Pharisees that wanted to start communicating with the Herodians at that point to plot to kill Jesus because they really didn't like Jesus. They, there was something about the Herodians that the Pharisees wanted to start this line of communication. And that, again, for us, isn't a big deal. To someone in the first century who understood the climate and the political climate and things like that in Israel, this would have jumped, out, jumped off the page at them. The, the Herodians and the Pharisees are teaming up to do something together. This is incredibly strange, incredibly strange moment in Scripture that these two guys that can't stand each other are doing something together, teaming up for a debate. You know, this is, uh, we had our election this past week, and it seems to never end or whatever, but, uh, you know, we, we think of how polarized our society is, right? It would be like me telling you today that Ted Cruz and Kamala Harris have joined up together to debate against someone. You'd be like, huh? <laughs> I'm pretty sure those two can't agree on the color of the sky, right? You, you would never think of those two teaming up together to confront some issue or some some group or some person because they themselves are so polarized on seemingly every issue. Uh, and so that's as political as I'll get today, so don't worry. Um, but the, the, the first century Jews reading this, they would have seen these two groups teaming up and being like, what? Why? The Herodians, they were pro-Roman authority. The Herodians loved Roman authority because it gave them political clout. It gave them power. The Herodians functioned like puppet kings for the Roman Empire. And so the Herodians, they didn't mind the Roman Empire whatsoever. They, they preferred them being in control because it gave them power in Israel. And so uh, the Herodian dynasty was really, uh, most, most religious Jews were appalled by them. They were like, oh man, you're, you're selling out to Rome. You guys are awful. They didn't, like the, they didn't like the Herodians, especially the Pharisees. I mean, of all of the religious groups in Israel, the Pharisees above all could not stand the Herodians for that very reason because the Pharisees were very anti-Rome. They were very anti-Roman authority. As a matter of fact, it, it was the Pharisees who were, they were just hoping someday, oh God, please send this Davidic Messiah so we can correct everything that is wrong in Israel, starting with the Herodians. Wipe them out with this Messiah that you're going to send us. That's how they would have thought of this coming uh, Messiah. And so the fact that the Pharisees and the Herodians are together, this is strange, a, a very strange alliance. But Jesus was a threat to both of them. And so an enemy of your enemy is your friend, right? That's kind of what's playing out right here. So to the Herodians, Jesus was a threat 
He was so popular with the people that it threatened their political clout. And that's what they feared about Jesus. And to the Pharisees, Jesus was a threat because his popularity threatened their religious influence. And so they, they teamed up together. Jesus is a threat to you. He's a threat to us. Let's go trap him in his talk. Now, when you're reading through the commentaries, the, the commentators all unanimously love to point out that word for trap in the Greek because it's the only time it's used in the New Testament. And it, it's a hunting term. This trap is like, it's, it's to take something by hunting. And so the emphasis here, if we were reading it in Greek, is, is like the Pharisees and the Herodians have teamed up for the hunt. They're out for the kill, and they're hunting Jesus. And so their hunting strategy, did you notice how it began? With all of this insincere praise, right? It's flattery. That's their uh, method of choice here. We know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, Jesus. You know, you can just imagine that, that, that fluctuation in their voice as they're saying that to him. We know that, you know, you're not the type of guy that needs to go find someone to get your back. You, 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 don't, you don't show favoritism towards others. You're just about the, the facts. You don't care what other people think. You just care what God thinks. Yeah, we all know that about you, Jesus. We really appreciate that about you. You're not swayed by appearances, it says, but truly teach the way of God. We know for you, it's God's way or the highway. And so their flattery is, is used to try to paint Jesus into a corner. And I think they're doing this very intentionally. They don't want Jesus to, to appeal to anyone else. They don't want Jesus to look for help. They want to they paint him in a corner and make him answer this question. Remember last time when the, when the Sanhedrin cornered Jesus, he counters you with a question. You answer my question and I'll answer yours. But they don't, want, they don't want that to happen this time. They're just like, no, 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 no. We know you teach the way of God. We don't need to play the question game this time, Jesus. We just want you to answer this question for us because we know you are so capable and you teach truth. We just want to learn from you right now. No reason not to answer our question, Jesus. And here it is. Is it lawful to pay taxes? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? Now, when they're saying lawful, they, of course, are referring to God's law. Is it lawful under the, under, under the Old Testament law and the Torah? Is it lawful, the Pentateuch, is it lawful considering all of that that God has given us, to pay a tax to Caesar? Is it right before God? You know the way of God. Tell us if it's right. So here's the rock and the hard place that Jesus is in. If he says yes, well, of course, he's going to make all the people angry, right? According to the Pharisees, they're like, they're like, well, we hope he says yes, and then he can lose credibility with all of the Jews. Because for the Jews, to pay a tax to Caesar, we have to understand, it's not just because it's too expensive. It wasn't just because it was inconvenient. It was, that, it was blasphemy to pay tax to an entity that considered Caesar God. It was the imperial cult that really grinded their gears, that caused them to gnash their teeth. We can't pay money to this imperial cult. They don't recognize Yahweh. They consider the Caesar to be God. I'm not going to pay money to a false God. And so if Jesus says yes to pay this tax, he's going to be guilty, according to the Pharisees, of blasphemy. But if he says no, the Herodians have everything they need to eliminate this threat. Because remember, they don't like him either. And, and, and if he's encouraging people in Israel to not pay a tax to Caesar, that's trouble for the Herodians. They're the puppet kings. They're the ones that Rome allows to be in charge. As long as you keep order here and keep the money flow coming, you can be in charge here. The moment you can't do that, there's a problem. And so if Jesus answers this question by saying, no, don't pay taxes to Caesar, the Herodians will feel as though they have an obligation to execute him immediately because he's going to be, uh, he's going to be starting a revolt in Israel, and then that's major problems for them. So what's Jesus going to do here? The trap is set. He's in a rock and a hard place. 
There's no way out. He has to answer the question. Let's see what he says in verses 15 through 17. But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one and he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. A genius response. So he starts by noting their hypocrisy, right? Mark wants us to understand that Jesus knew uh, they were trying to corner him with all of that flattery, right? He understood the hypocrisy there. And he knows they don't think he, he teaches the way of God. So Jesus is just like, why put me to the test? Why are you guys, why? Why are you constantly picking on me here? I mean, I, I know, that's, that's Jesus' way of saying, I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. And I just, I just imagine, like, you ever read these moments in Scripture and you, and you begin to see it play out in your mind? I'm very visual like that. And so I can just imagine when Jesus says, why put me to the test? I just imagine these Pharisees and these Herodians kind of smirking. Like, yeah, we know. We, we know you know, and that's okay. you got to answer anyway, don't you? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. Now, a denarius, that was one day's wage. And that leads a lot of scholars to believe that this specific tax that they're talking about, as there were many different types of taxes in that day, just like there are in this day, was the, the, the specific tax that they're speaking of is likely the poll tax. It was like a census tax. And so you had to pay one denarius a year just to exist in Israel because, you were, uh, because Rome was in charge. You had, to, you had to work one entire day, one entire day's wage, uh, and you had to pay that just for Caesar. That'd be sent to him. That's, that's for starters. That's how taxes began to work in this time. And so it's likely that they are asking specifically about this tribute tax that was uh, supposed to be paid once a year to Caesar. So this denarius that Jesus asks for, by this point in time, Tiberius Caesar is the emperor of Rome. And so uh, we think of Caesar, we think of Caesar Augustus, but he's gone by this point in time, and, and Tiberius Caesar is in charge. Side note, Caesar was just a way that they, it became, even though it was Caesar Augustus' name, it became a way of just referring to the office of emperor. And so from that point on, whoever was emperor, that was the Caesar. That's how they referred to him. So that's why, should we give the Caesar what if, that which is Caesar's, you know? Uh, give the Caesar that which is Caesar's. They just re refer to Caesar this way, so it's synonymous with, with emperor. But on, on the front side of this coin, you would have had a picture then of Tiberius Caesar. And when you flip it over, here's what it says. Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus himself. It's just as good as saying, son of God. So, you know, I think Jesus asking for this coin, hey, you some, somebody give me a coin. Let's, let's take a look at this. The fact that he asked for that, everybody knows what we, everybody knew what was on that coin. Just, I, I would not have to ask you for a penny to prove to you Abraham Lincoln's on that penny. We all know who's on the penny. And so they all knew Caesar was going to be on that. They knew what was inscribed on that coin. But Jesus, for dramatic effect, perhaps, for an object lesson, asks for that coin and, and looks at it. And, he, and he's setting them up for this climactic pronouncement, right? And it's also setting them up in the sense that, hey, the fact that you have one of these coins in your pocket already proves that you've bought into this system, right? You're using that, that currency, so evidently you don't think it's too bad because you're, it's in your pocket right now. You all have one of those coins readily available in your, in your pouch or whatever. And so these, these Pharisees are holding the, the, the coin that's a part of this blasphemous system. But Jesus' response, it's, it's, it's just, it is marvelous. They marveled because it's marvelous. It's disorienting. Whose image is on this? Who, whose likeness is on this coin? Well, it's Caesar's. Who, whose inscription is on this? Well, it's Caesar's. Well, okay. His name's on it. Sounds like it's his. So give, give him what's his. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Now, when you really just process that line, there's some ambiguity there, I, I think, if, and maybe we don't even have enough time to really go into that. But when you just read that line over and over, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, Caesar's and to God the things 
that are God's. How did the Pharisees interpret that? Versus how did the Herodians interpret that? I mean, it's just, it's a brilliant answer and it causes them, no doubt, to have to think and process and, you know, like they're, you know, the, they don't have enough RAM in that moment to really come up with like a response. They're just kind of like, ah, uh, let me think. I, I, uh, okay, wow, all right. Well, I think there's some practical uh, life lessons that we can't overlook at this point. If, if you want the most practical life application possible out of this moment in, in the text, uh, pay your taxes. <laughs> that's it. I mean, that's about, as, that's about the most simple possible application of this text. The scripture instructs us that uh, we should pay our taxes, right? Uh, and that's, this isn't the only place that does that. So I know that's a downer. Uh, but we got we to pay our taxes. Paul backs up this teaching up. When you go into to the book of Romans, and if you want a homework passage, almost every Sunday I preach, I like to give you a little homework passage to maybe uh, meditate upon later in the day or the next morning. Write down Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7, and you'll see Paul teaching about paying taxes there. Be subject to, to the governing authorities. And, and we don't like that because we're so polarized in our society. All right? And, but here's the way he qualifies it there, and I think it's worth thinking about. Paul says in Romans 13, he says, For there is no authority except from God. He's saying ultimately there's no authority except from God. And those, who exi- and those that exist have been instituted by God. <laughs> Nobody's in power unless God allows them to be in power. No one can be in a position of authority unless God puts them there or allows them to be there. God is ultimately sovereign over all of those things. God's rule is above and beyond all of those things. And so regardless of how corrupt you may view the government at any given time or any politician at any given time, regardless of whatever you may believe or think is happening or or what conspiracy you may want to buy into at any given time that may or may not end up to be true later, whatever, any believer is supposed to rest in the fact that God is sovereign over all of those things, despite any results that you may or may not like. And that's, a, that's, a, that's a really important truth to have, isn't it? I mean, we, 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 we know from this teaching that, that God is sovereign over all things, and so we can rest and have peace in the midst of any circumstance, regardless of the outcome. But he also teaches in that passage that the, the authorities that are in place, they, they function like the common grace of God. Like, when you think of common grace, you think of that passage that says, you know, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. It, you know, the, the, the rain is going to be a good thing for both of those uh, people, whether they're just or, or unjust, it, because God is taking care of all of creation. There's a common grace there, regardless of belief. Well, it's the same thing with the government. Uh, Paul is, is tying that in to... Uh, how God works in this world. And so there's at least, regardless of the, the power that's in place, there's at least some level of security that comes with that, that God provides some level of security and peace through governments. God provides at least some level of consequences to actions by having you know, laws in place and governments and things. And so here's how Paul sums it up there. He says, so with all that said, pay taxes to whom taxes are owed, Pay revenue to who uh, revenue is owed. Respect uh, to whom respect is owed and honor to whom honor is owed. Just respect and honor. Live peaceably as much as you can. Leave, li- live peaceably in this world as much as you can because God is ultimately in control. So we should be good citizens. That teaching is all over scripture. Pay your taxes, be a good citizen. Now, obviously we don't take that too far, right? Obviously if if we are living under a system of government that is trying to force us to do something immoral, that's where we draw our line because our ultimate allegiance is to God. And so where the government would try to, to force us to do something immoral, we have to not do that. We obey God over and above any law or authority in this world. And so, for example, when Christians were ordered to stop preaching the gospel, they didn't say, oh, well, Paul said we've got to be good citizens, so we better stop preaching the gospel. Well, no. When they were told not to preach the gospel, they preached it anyway. Because God is in authority above all those things. And we can't, it would be immoral to not take the gospel into the world. So, of course, we have to continue to do that. You know, when, 
when Daniel was ordered to bow down and pray to a false idol, that's where he drew the line. He was very compliant up to that point. He was a great citizen up to that point. But when they started to force him to do something immoral, of course he said, no, I, I, I cannot do that. And so he chose the lion's den as opposed to disobeying God. And so there's obviously a balance there that we have to strike. But we want to live peaceably, peaceably and, 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 and be a good citizen, be, be responsible with that as much as that we, we can, be subject to governing authorities. So while the Bible teaches that, it says that we have a responsibility to do that, but an even greater responsibility to be good citizens of the kingdom of heaven. So we give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but ultimately we give to God the things that are God's. You know, all, everything is God's, right? Especially you. And so that coin, when he looked at it, right, it had the, the image of Caesar. It was in, made in the likeness of Caesar, but you were made in the image of of God. You were made in the likeness of God. We remember Genesis chapter 1. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So that's ultimately what we are to honor. But we're still supposed to pay our taxes at the same time. I want to share to you, uh, before we move on, I want to share to you just one passage. Luke gives us a, a very specific detail that the other gospel writers uh, don't hit as hard. And uh, in light of this passage, I wanted to read to you. Whenever they take Jesus, whenever the Sanhedrin, you know, they, this escalates throughout the week and they eventually get Jesus before Pilate. Do you remember how they accused Jesus specifically? Think about what we just learned. And here's what it says. Then the whole company of them, them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, that is Jesus, saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he is himself, that saying he himself is Christ, a king. So whenever they bring Jesus before Pilate, they, they said, this guy's trying to tell us not to pay that tribute tax. And then we have this very specific teaching in which Jesus says, no, pay to Caesar what is Caesar's. And then they just straight up lie about it. They just straight up lie you know, this, uh, we owe our ultimate allegiance to God. It's, it's, it's absolute. And so what I want you to think about as we close this sermon out is, is that true of your life? Is that true of your life? When you think of how when political emotions get so tense and start swirling around and frustrating everyone you know, is it true of your life that you give more respect and honor and submission to God than you do your preferred political party? Can you say that? I, I would love for every Christian in America just to ask themselves that question. Because I swear, and you're not supposed to do that, but man, today, in today's world, so many professing Christians, I just think, wow, if they were even half as passionate and as, as excited about the kingdom of heaven that they claim to be a part of, as they are their preferred political party, how much would this kingdom advance in America right now? I get so frustrated with just this overwhelming allegiance from Christians today to a preferred political party over and above, head and shoulders above their allegiance to the kingdom of God. We should feel so much conviction today in America over this. So much conviction. Let me ask it to you this way. If it's a sin to withhold taxes from the U.S. Treasury, if we can deduce that from Scripture, if it's a sin to withhold taxes from the US, U.S. Treasury, how much more of an injustice is it for you to withhold your life from the one who made you? You know, or maybe think of it this way. Whenever you're doing your taxes this year, what do we do? We look for loopholes. What can I do to pay the, the bare minimum of taxes? How many things can I possibly write off or uh, justify writing off in order to pay the bare minimum, right? We do that to the IRS all the time. And then how crazy is it that believers often do the same exact thing in the kingdom of God, but maybe even worse. Uh, how, how much, how little can I do and still convince myself that I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God? How little passion can I display and still make those around me believe that I am a professing Christian. 
we often look for those loopholes in our life and, and we backslide into these frames of mind and, and, and behave this way and deny God what is his. Jesus is calling us to something more in this passage than just paying our taxes. He's calling us to give our lives to him, to truly live for him, to, to reserve the majority of our passion in this world for his, his kingdom, to reserve most of our energy and our thinking to serving his kingdom and to making his gospel known and his glory declared in this world. Is that where your allegiance lies? If we stand outside of your life and examine it, are we going to find more political passion than passion for God's kingdom? These are the things I want us to think about as we close in prayer. What's holding you back? What's that point of resistance that keeps you from committing on a deeper level? What's that point that you are withholding from God right now, that you should be giving to God right now. It's a way that you could be serving and proclaiming his gospel that you aren't. Let's pray. Lord, I ask for this conviction for each and every one of us today. It's so often, Lord, that we get so distracted and, Lord, the, the news of this world impacts our emotions and our lifestyle more than the news of the gospel. That's, that's embarrassing when we fall into a, a frame of mind like that, Lord. But I just, I just ask for that conviction to change the way we think today. I pray, Lord, that if we feel that, that conviction, that we would act upon that conviction by your grace with repentance. That we change the way we think, that it would... It would begin to be the truth that in our lives, it's so much more plain to see that our allegiance is to you over and above any other thing that we may participate in in this world. Lord, because your kingdom and your purposes are more important than any other thing that we could possibly involve ourselves with. Father, may we do these things by your grace and to your glory. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm.